Good afternoon. Welcome. Well, uh, some of you haven't been in our earlier session, so I will introduce uh, myself. I am Ernesto Cedillo, director of the Yale Center for the Study of Globalization. And um, the students that just show up, I want to tell you that uh, uh, we are having a conference uh, which we have titled Nuclear Weapons, the Greatest Peril to Civilization. We have had uh, a very interesting uh, program this morning uh, looking uh, at the historical, uh, the intellectual history of uh, the ideas of nuclear abolition. Uh, we have looked uh, at the consequence of uh, the use of nuclear weapons, uh, envisioning uh, scenarios, and we have had a, a very interesting uh, speech by uh, the High Commissioner on Disarmament, Ambassador Sergio Duarte. And I think now we are getting to the very inspira inspirational moment of this uh, conference. You know, it's always good to have uh, inspiration in life. And we receive uh, that inspiration for, from many sources, but particularly from exceptional individuals. And today we have with us uh, an exceptional individual, a person who really has uh, done many things in life, and by doing that, he has inspired others to perhaps not to imitate him, but to pursue uh, from their own perspective, uh, goals that are similar, ideas that are similar to those that uh, our participant at this moment has pursued in life. And that person is uh, Ted Turner. Many of you know him as a very successful businessman. I like to define uh, Ted Turner as one person that well before uh, the Microsoft uh, guys, the Google guys, the internet guides, really was one of the modern architects of uh, globalization. Because what he did with CNN uh, a couple of decades ago was precisely that, give the world a degree of interconnectedness, a degree of access to information, uh, real time, that we hadn't seen uh, before in, in, in human history. And this was with television, uh, this was by placing people all over the world to report to the world what was going on uh, in uh, the most distant places in the world. And Ted Turner, I insist, before internet got us globalized. But uh, even more interesting is that Ted Turner, uh, rather early, uh, uh, he also started to have big concerns, big worries uh, about the big problems that are shared by humanity at large. Uh, he started with great talent to point to situations which uh, mean or bring about a threat to humanity that cannot be addressed by a single country alone problems that need international cooperation uh, to, be, to be addressed. I think uh, one of his um, um, greatest achievements is uh, to do something that sometimes people like to put in rather vernacular terms, you know, terms, put your money where your mouth is. And Tev has used his success as a businessman to support uh, those causes in which it is very important for countries, for people, for diplomats, for leaders to speak and come to, to, to fundamental agreements. One field in which uh, he particularly has distinguished himself is on the question of uh, non-proliferation and disarmament, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, right after the end of the Cold War, uh, Ted uh, noticed that there was uh, a unique historical uh, opportunity to retake or take with the specific actions this uh, enormous challenge of uh, uh, 
uh, proliferation and disarmament. And he promoted this uh, initiative, which is called the Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, which uh, has been a fantastic mechanism to secure uh, dangerous nuclear materials and also to support the disarmament effort, particularly of, the, of Russia and of the former Soviet Union. And he put money into that enter enterprise and he attracted great political leaders to be part of that uh, cause. So I cannot really think of a better personality to come to this conference and to give us uh, some uh, inspiration. Uh, and that is why I am so happy and so proud to welcome you, Mr. Ted Turner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President, for that uh, glowing introduction. I really, uh, really appreciate it. And I want to, I have 20 minutes uh, for, for my presentation, and then I think we have 30 minutes or so for uh, discussion and questions and uh, answers. Uh, I want to start by making the statement, I have given a great deal of thought over a number of years to the nuclear situation and uh, been very concerned about uh, and, 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 and worried and, and, and thankful at the same time that, that nothing has seriously gone wrong, that we haven't had uh, a, nuclear, a nuclear exchange or nuclear annihilation. Uh, but, 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 but my conclusion, and I'll talk about how I got there a little later, my conclusion, because I want to be certain to make it very clear, my conclusion is that the only uh, solution to proliferation, the only way that we're uh, going to get out of this box that we have built for ourselves is the complete abolition uh, of all nuclear weapons all over the world and agreement by all countries not to make, use, deploy, or do anything uh, with, 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 uh, with any weapons of mass destruction, but certainly not, uh, not nuclear. And uh, I just, Feel, feel like that's the only way. We got all the countries of the world have to play by the same set of rules. The, Jonathan Shell has a wonderful new book, book out, uh, Seven Decades, uh, and I just, just finished reading it, and he comes to the exact, uh, exact same, exact same con conclusion. The smaller countries in the world, uh, they have the same rights as the larger countries. And for us to sit there with 10,000 nuclear weapons and tell everybody else in the world that they can't have any, particularly when we uh, allow Israel to keep their 100 nuclear weapons, and, uh, and also uh, we were opposed to Pakistan and India at the time, but just as soon as they got them, well, they joined the club. After you, if, you, if you don't get blown off the face of the earth by the United States in the first year after you get your nuclear weapons, then you'll be you're in the club, you know, and once you're in, it's okay. But that's bullshit. You can't, you can't ask people to do that. By God, we've all got the same rights. And uh, another thing the United States needs to do is quit telling everybody what in the world what they need to do. And uh, if we want people to be like us, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that, uh, the way to do it, the way to get them to be like us is to do such a good job and be so prosperous and happy and set such a good example that people will want to mimic it. That's, uh, that's the way to get people to come along with you is uh, do like Tom Sawyer did or Huckleberry Finn, you know, make it look like so much fun to paint the fence that everybody else grabs a brush and paints the fish that fence. They don't want to go fishing, they'd rather paint the fence. Uh, so. I, I really, uh, I, I really feel that that's that's the only the only way, and and also, we have a we have a, an, an opportunity now because we've got several challenges that really uh, that really uh, uh, wh wh where the world of where humanity faces uh, terrible dangers, and and right behind the, the the nuclear threat, right behind it 
is the, is the global warming threat and the concurrent uh, collapse of the environment that's occurring all over the world. We've got to uh, straighten that situation out, too. And then the third thing that we've got to get uh, control over in another book I strongly recommend to you is Lester Brown's latest uh, book, uh, Plan B 3.0, which deals with all the world's problems in 200 and some odd pages. And, uh, and then it's got all the solutions in there, too. And, and the, third, the third big problem that we need to work on is stabilizing population because, as Lester says in his book, if we don't stabilize population, uh, all the other things that we're doing are going to, we're still going to go down the drain because uh, they just, we just cannot uh, keep increasing exponentially the way, the, the way that we have been because we just put too much uh, tax on, uh, on the natural environment and it, it can't, uh, can't uh, support more of us at a decent standard of, standard of living. Those are the three major challenges humanity faces, and we really need to tackle them all right now, and we need to have successful conclusions. So why not put them all together? I mean, there's going to be a, a lot of, uh, it's not going to be easy to have total nuclear disarmament, and certainly not to have it in a reasonable period of time, and I want to make one other, one other point, uh, is that uh, in thinking how we're going to uh, get there, how we're going to do it, that there has to be some sort of, some sort of uh, rough plan that, where, it, where, where it can show the, the countries of the world that it can be done. And I'm trying to think of uh, a solution to that, how we actually go from the nuclear weapons that we have now with eight or nine nuclear powers to zero as quickly as we can. Why not a five or a ten year plan where we freeze, we agree at the United Nations, all the countries of the world do, to, to freeze them and, and, and gradually reduce them over a five or ten year period. Uh, ten percent, say ten percent a year, that uh, the United States with ten thousand nuclear weapons would, would destroy a thousand a year. Uh, Pakistan with 100 nuclear weapons would destroy 10 a year. So we'd all stay for those 10 years relatively the same. And uh, it, it, because we're going to have to have a plan that treats everybody relatively equally. Now, when we get to the global warming situation, it's another, another set of problems because we're not going to be able to do that equally because the developing countries don't uh, pollute the atmosphere anything like uh, at the rate that the, uh, that the wealthy developed nations are that use much more uh, energy. So that we're going to have to come up with a special formula for that that's going to be the most difficult challenge that humanity's ever faced. Because we have to have 191 countries agree on that. On the nuclear situation, we only have to have eight or nine, depending on whether North Korea really has nuclear weapons or not. I don't even, I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But Count them in, count them out. I, at, uh, at some point, that's the, the other thing we're going to have to have is complete uh, inspections all over the world. Well, countries are all going to have to agree to that, but that doesn't, uh, that shouldn't bother us. We can, we can do that. And we have the IAEA and we have the United Nations. We already have, uh, we already have the, the, the bodies that we need to administrate this. They're already in existence. They don't have to be invented and uh, for the most part, they have most of the world's respect and admiration and because they've done so much, so much good. Are they perfect? No, of course they're not perfect. But nothing that we do is perfect. Uh, but we're going to have to get closer to it now than we ever have before, or we're going to be toast. And, uh, and, 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 and our planet's going to be toast, too. I mean, not, the, thing, the thing that really upsets me uh, one of the things that upsets me is that uh, with, with nuclear annihilation, and it'll happen sooner or later, if we don't get rid of the weapons, uh, the weapons are going to get rid of us. I mean, it, it, at some point, because just remember, a couple of months ago, that uh, B-52 bomber took off from Nebraska and flew down to one of the Gulf Coast states, was Louisiana or Texas, and they had four armed hydrogen bombs on the plane that got on accidentally. Six, I'm sorry, that's right, Matt. They had six, and they didn't even know they were on there, and for several days, they were missing. They did, when they landed, they didn't know they had them on there. I mean, geez, I mean, just get that. We, we should all, 
say, and when I, we say our prayers at night, I say, thank you, God, for getting us through one more day, that, you know, one more day of, 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 of life uh, where we haven't blown ourselves up. I mean, what kind of sense does it make to destroy millions of people, children, and think of those of you, how many people like their museums, you know? I mean, I like museums, but, you know, we're going to blow up all the museums. I mean, you know, there'll be nothing left uh, if anybody did arrive here a million years from now uh, after, we'd, after we'd burned the world uh, up, they, they, they wouldn't be able to find hardly any record that we were here. You know, I mean, at least the pharaohs, I mean, Egypt, I was just in Egypt, it's beautiful. And, and I went around and saw all the uh, antiquities and went to all the museums and spent a, a week doing it. Uh, at least there's still a record. But, but by God, if you take, uh, you take a couple of hydrogen bombs and, and, and explode them right over the pyramids at Giza, there wouldn't be two stones left on top of one another. You wouldn't be able to, to find, uh, find the thing. And, 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 and the, uh, the curator of your museum was at our dinner last night. He's probably here right now that uh, runs the museum here. And, uh, you know, it would be a real shame to use, lose Yale and the muse museum. You know, it's, uh, anyway, th this could be the, the what we're, we're going to exterminate all the higher forms of life with that, uh, with nuclear war. There won't be anything left except maybe a few cockroaches. Uh, that's a hell of a thing to have done to ourselves. You know, it's, it's one thing if we get struck by a meteor, or we have a bunch of volcanic explosions that, that, that burn up the world, but to actually commit global suicide. I mean, is life that bad? I, I, I just got back this summer. I went to the Galapagos Islands. I took my family down there and looked at all the tame animals that you can, they won't let you pet them, but you could because they sit right there because people don't kill them and beat them up down there. And uh, I came back. I came back saying, this world is worth saving. This world is worth saving. Life is worth carrying on. So let's not deliberately kill ourselves. Who, who wants to commit global suicide? And who wants to kill millions of people? Children, grandmothers, grandfathers. Who, who wants to do that? Nobody. I talk all over the world. I never find anybody who wants to do it. Then why in the hell do we have these weapons sitting there? Why do we... I know why. We built them during the Cold War, but the Cold War is over. We're in another era. War is not the way to get things done anyway. The great military powers of today are not going to be the powers of tomorrow. The, 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 the countries that are going to be the great powers of tomorrow are the ones with the best educational systems, the ones with the best health care, the ones with the best science and technology, the ones with the best businessmen, the ones with the most integrity. Those are going to be the countries that uh, are going to be the champions of tomorrow. I mean, look at this stupid military stuff in a war. Look at the war in Iraq. Here we are with a $500 billion military budget, and we're being defeated or at least tied by uh, a group of guys uh, down there, the Taliban, and, 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 and they don't even have generals, and they don't have a headquarters, and they don't have any tanks. They don't have nothing but a few rifles. But, but they're able to, uh, by by being guerrillas and having moved into the cities, they negated the tremendous strength that the United States had. And it's not just us. We're not the first superpower. We already lost in Vietnam. We killed 3 million people in Vietnam. We lost 60,000. I think it's 150 or 1,500. You know, if you count the body count, we won. But you don't do it that way. It's who's in possession of the country at the end of the day. And the Vietnamese were in possession of their own country for the first time in a long time, thank goodness. Every time I see a Vietnamese, anybody from Vietnam here in the room? Well, whenever I see one, I apologize for what we did to their country. They didn't attack us. They posed no threat to us whatsoever. We just decided we're going to do a preemptive war, just like we've done in Iraq. And we're not the only ones, the only superpower that's been defeated by the developing world country. The Russians were beaten in Afghanistan, too. I mean, we're getting beaten there, too, incidentally. Uh, we have so few people there that they're growing their opium, and we're not stopping that. You know, it's uh, a drug situation. Anyway, I think that's about, can, I, can we go to question and answer? I'm, I'm about out of time. Anyway, anyway that's my presentation.
Now we'll have a little question and answers. Thank you very much. Well, I promise you that this will be inspirational. It has been because uh, Ted, as usual, has delivered. Uh, Ted uh, has accepted to take uh, a few questions. Whoever wants to make a question should walk to the microphone. Microphone. Let me say one other thing, Mr. President. I, I just want to make it very clear, which I didn't say earlier, because I didn't have a prepared text. I wanted to speak from the heart rather than just read something. And uh, I, I want to make it clear that the opinions that I expressed are mine, not necessarily that of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which I'm on the, on, the, on the board of, or the United Nations Foundation. I, I, I obviously support the United Nations. I'm wearing a tie. I, I'm a strong internationalist. Uh, but I just want to make it clear that those were my own personal opinions. Well, I, I, we wish uh, more people and more institutions share your opinions. So. Who wants to make the first question? Steven? Please. Thanks for coming today. I have two children adopted from Vietnam, so I appreciate your remarks about uh, the Vietnam Vietnamese war. I, I am hard of hearing, too. That's another thing. Is so I'm going to probably. Yeah, okay. just, and please ask. Sound. Sound. OK, yeah, that's good. That's right. OK. My name is Linda Gunter. I'm with Beyond Nuclear, and I have two children adopted from Vietnam, so I wanted to thank you for your remarks about Vietnam. And, and uh, it's such a, it's a country that uh, forgives so well. When I visited there, the welcome we get is incredible. I wanted to ask you about the 500 billion that we've already wasted in Iraq, and what, how, um, and when you think about what we could do with that money and how we could apply it to good in the world, um, have you any advice or thoughts on ending this hemorrhaging and being able to start to use that money wisely. Well, first of all, I, 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 I neglected to mention that Lester Brown, and I, I think it's, it's around $100 billion a year to straighten out all the world's problems, to have, a, have a, a, a school lunch program for all the poor kids in the world so they get at least one decent meal a day, the poorest kids in the world, I should say. Uh, and, and, and to uh, educate, every, make sure everyone has an education, that we do away with the illiteracy, and, and, and the, other, the other problems that uh, Jeffrey Sachs and the Millennium Goals of the United Nations to eliminate poverty over, over, the, next, uh, over the next few years would take about $100 billion a year. And, and, and the global military budget is, one, uh, is, 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 ten, is 10 times that much. It's a uh, trillion dollars a year. And the U.S. Is, 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 is half of it. We're spending now close to 20 times as much as Russia and 20 times as much as China, which are the other two largest countries in the world. And they are not our enemies. We, we have a very, very strong military-industrial complex in this country, frighteningly strong, so strong that they basically are spending money in every congressional district in the United States, uh, uh, and, 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 and they like making money and selling all this crap, uh, this useless stuff, aircraft carriers. I mean, what good is it? You know, we put them in the Gulf there uh, by, by Iran, and we run them up and down, you know. Yeah, good deal. You know what? You know, it, we could attack if we wanted, but, you know, I'll tell you, I, I don't think we should. You know, I, I think that's really, really foolish. But, but we should cut our military budget way back over a period of time, I think, because it's, we're wasting that money. And we're, we've got these huge deficits now because of the war in Iraq and because of this big mili bloated military expenditure. And uh, if we're going to, if we, we're going to have to cut back on our military budget, our, on, on conventional stuff, if we're going to get the Russians to agree with us to go without nuclear weapons, then they have to feel like we're not threatening them. Right now, we threaten, we threaten the whole world. And, uh, uh, because of our military budget, why do we need such a huge military budget? Who are our enemies? We don't have any enemies other than po poverty and terrorism. There's no nation that's a, an enemy of ours. The Chinese just want to sell us, keep selling us shoes. You know, they they, they want to get cars. They want to have a good life. I mean, the Chinese aren't our enemies, and neither are the Russians. If we and something else we need to go back and do, we should have done. I said it 15 years ago. The Cold War ended is we ought to have invite Russia to join NATO. That, then we don't even need NATO, but why not? In, 
Invite them in. I mean, they're not our enemies, but treat them like friends. That's, that's what I did in the Goodwill games. And this was in the middle of the Cold War, and we got along great. You know, it's next thing you know, the Cold War was over. <laughs> it wasn't very hard. What, who's next? Thank you. I'm, my name's Jeff Alexander. I'm a sociologist here at Yale. And you pointed out how irrational this um, nuclear arms race is. So it would seem to be a matter of just common sense. But I'm a sociologist, so I want to ask you, what would be the social conditions that would have to convince these governments? In other words, I remember back the nuclear freeze movement which was a kind of a social movement, uh, don't you think we need that kind of um, mobilization of the base uh, of people around, especially in the US at least and elsewhere? It, it has to become not just from the elites the down, but from the bottom up. Well, guess what? We've got, uh, we've got a candidate running for president who Obama has already come out publicly and said he's for zero nuclear weapons. So. We haven't had a presidential candidate that I can ever remember say that, not a serious one. And, 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 and we've got, uh, you know, you've got uh, Secretary George Shultz and Sam Nunn and Henry Kissinger and uh, Bill Perry, the four of them have done those two editorials, uh, op-eds in the, in, the, uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal, and they've gotten a whole lot of other uh, former uh, big cheeses in our government that want to get rid of all nuclear weapons. We're closer today than we've, than we've ever been. It's not going to be easy, but it, it could be because, you know, it's just time that we stop doing dumb things and start doing smart things. You know, I mean, really, I mean, it, it's that clear, and everybody can understand that. Everybody can understand it in Africa and Asia and Europe, you know, because we've got this global warming thing, and everybody recognizes that, too. We, and while we're working on it, we might as well straighten everything out. You know, like an alcoholic that decided to give up the booze and straighten his life out. You know? Thank you. Um, how likely is it that if the United States were to declare our intentions to fully disarm um, or by whatever gradual plan, how likely is it that the rest of the nuclear countries would follow suit and does that matter? Well, what we have to do, first of all, Britain has already announced it. Their new secretary or whatever has already said, we want to get rid of nuclear weapons completely as soon as possible. So you've got one of the eight that's already agreed. Now, you, we're not going to, I do not uh, advocate that we, that we unilaterally declare we're going to get rid of our nuclear weapons. What we should declare is that we're ready to sit down and discuss getting rid of them if everybody, everybody's got to get rid of them at the same time and agree not, not to do it. And the countries that don't have them have to, have to agree to that too. But just remember this, there are eight nuclear countries now, maybe nine. There have been four that have already disarmed. Ukraine, Belarus, um, Kazakhstan, and South Africa have already given up their nuclear weapons. Those three uh, former republics of the uh, Soviet Union sent them all back to Moscow. You know, you can have them. We don't want the goddamn things. Pretty smart, huh? Anyway, anyway, uh, but, but, but we'll do it together. And, and, and the pressure on everybody, first of all, people, it's the right thing to do. And at the end of the day, if we're going to survive, particularly with the high technologies that we have, like nuclear weapons, we're going to have to learn to be a little bit smarter than we were in the past. We just can't go around hitting each other over the head with swords and knives and stab each other and, you know, First of all, that's uncivilized and inhuman. You know, what we want to do is start acting like decent, kind-hearted, intelligent, educated human beings. That's, you know, that, you do that, you don't want nuclear weapons. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen. I'm a freshman here in the nuclear dilemmas class. Um, you mentioned a couple of objectives being, one being eliminating nuclear proliferation, Another one being um, dealing with overpopulation. Now, as a lot of nations said they want nuclear energy in order to deal with the, the rising needs to, these, um, to deal with overpopulation, um, a lot of them find themselves turning to that energy source. But that energy source is one 
that, uh, as Mr. Shell explained to our class, is about seven-tenths of the way to making nuclear weapons. What's your opinion on nuclear energy, and is it really feasible? Well, I, I can answer that. I, I like solar and wind uh, better because they're cleaner and they're less, ex less expensive. Uh, and, they, it, it, and nuclear power is still dangerous because we still haven't figured out what to do with the, with the waste. However, I, I believe if, if knowing that countries that want to build nuclear power plants, it's fine. I, I, I don't think you can have nuclear power with low enriched uranium, which is not weapons grade. So I don't think we should. And, 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 and obviously, uh, countries that have uh, nuclear uh, uh, cycles and, and capability, anybody can build a nuclear weapon if they want to. But if we've all agreed not to do it and we have supervision with the IAEA, Who's going to cheat? What are they going to do? You know, I've got one or two nuclear weapons. So you've got one or two nuclear weapons. You know, uh, th th there's, a, there's a way of dealing with that, too. If you have one or two countries in the world that absolutely refuse to cooperate, that are truly rogue states, when every, if, if everybody else decides they want to get rid of nuclear weapons but one or two countries, there's a way to handle it, and peacefully. And that is you boycott the country. The whole world, the United Nations, you give them warnings, say, if you don't go along with the rest of us, we're just going to boycott you, which that means is you have nobody come into your country. You can't, airplanes can't land anywhere else. We won't trade with you. You can do whatever you want to inside your own country. But no, no country can handle that. We, we, in the age of, of uh, globalization, no country can stand alone like that. And, and it wouldn't be worth it. So they could have two nuclear weapons, you know, so what? What are you going to do with them? You know, that's the other thing. What are we going to do with our 10,000? Are we going to dump them on Russia? If we do, the radioactive cloud c comes back within the next few days, and we're dead, too. It's using nuclear weapons on, on a large scale is suicide. So they're no good for anything except to threaten your neighbors. We don't like you, and we could bomb you if we wanted to. <laughs> you know, so you better do what we say. But they don't do what we say. Saddam Hussein didn't do what we said. The Vietnamese didn't do what we said. And if during the Vietnam War, if during the Vietnam War we would have given uh, Ho Chi Minh an ultimatum, say, listen, we're sick of this war. It's gone on long enough. And we want you to unconditionally surrender by next Friday at noon, or we're going to hit you with 100 nuclear bombs. You know what he said? Bring them on. He would have. Then what we do? Go do it? <laughs> it's, it's unthinkable. Who's got the next question? Rebecca Johnson, uh, Acronym Institute for Disarmament Diplomacy in, in London. I love the way you think and talk about these issues. Uh, and I have a mission for you, which is to get yourself into a room for a one-to-one -one with Gordon Brown without any of his business as usual um, advisors there. The reason why I say that is you're quite right that the mood music in Britain has changed and there's all this lovely talk about how they have a vision of a world free of nuclear weapon, how they want Britain to be seen as a, a laboratory for disarmament. Note, this is vision and scene. This is all about management of news because the decision three months earlier, in, May, uh, sorry, in March of last year, was forced through by Tony Blair to get the next generation of British nuclear weapons to take us not just beyond 2020, which is the current system, beyond the 2050s. Why? Three reasons were advanced, and only three. One was this status, you've dealt with that, the big powers of the future are going to be those that have well-educated, healthy, intelligent, forward-looking populations, not the ones with big weapons. You got that. The second one is insurance policy, that we don't know what the future might hold. Well, well, guess what? We do know quite a lot of what the future might hold, and if we don't deal with climate change, and if we carry on putting a lot of resources into nuclear weapons, we'll question? end up with nuclear uh, um, uh, winter and or climate change. My question is the third, and that's the job creation scheme, the, the, the industrial aspect, the defense industry's push on governments to keep going with the military and keep going with the nuclear weapons. You, as a brilliant entrepreneur and industrialist, how would you convince Gordon Brown to ignore that pressure and indeed convince the, the leaders of the other nuclear weapon states so that we actually can move beyond the rhetoric into the actuality of getting rid of nuclear weapons. Good. What was the question in a, a nutshell? <laughs> Come on over. Yeah. How do you convince the, uh, Gordon, Brown. Gordon Brown to use the 30 billion uh, pounds that he... 
Yeah, 30 billion pounds that they are planning to spend in the new Trident uh, okay. system. Uh, right, right, right. I got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Got it. Uh, first of all, I, as, I, as I already said, the way you've got to start this is not because the United States spends money too and the Russians spend money. We all spend money on our weapons. We, we have to sit down and agree to get rid of them and, 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 to, and, and, and to freeze work. If we're going to get rid of them, if we agree to do that, then there's no point in modernizing them. You can save that money and everybody would do it. If they, but you've got to get all the nuclear powers plus the rest of the world to agree to it. Now, the rest of the world's already agreed to it, uh, has already agreed to it in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation tr 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 Treaty, which the United States and Russia and all of the nuclear powers except India, Israel, and Pakistan. Those are the only three countries that didn't sign. But France did, so, and, and, and they agreed, they, they agreed uh, to get rid of nuclear weapons already back in 1956. We just haven't done it, so all we have to do is to uh, is to live up to the uh, live up to what we what we signed, and this is it. It's very short. I keep it in my wallet at all times. July first, nineteen sixty-eight. E this is quote: Each of the parties to the treaty undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and on a treaty of general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. We've already signed the treaty. All we have to do is sit down and agree that we're, gonna, that we're going to live up to what we've already agreed to. Thank you. Um, it seems to me the problem is that if we were to abolish nuclear weapons, there is nevertheless still an, a dramatic imbalance in terms of the military potential and strength. For example, the United States, certainly relative to the rest of the world. So how do we tie conventional military strength then to uh, the nuclear bomb? I don't think, I think w that, that the nuclear situation is so critical that we need to deal with that, deal with that first. Uh, and, and, and as part of it, the United States is going to be under a lot of pressure uh, when we get to the global warming part of things to cooperate there, and that's going to cost us some money too. And I think that'll lead to a cutback in our military budget over, over time. It won't be easy because of the strength and power of the military-industrial uh, complex. But it's not good for the American people. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, what are we going to do? Fight the whole world at once? And what are we going to fight them for? I mean, if we don't, the, the, the invasion of the United States is taking place along the Mexican border right now, but it's not, it's not coming with tanks or uh, landing craft. They're walking across the Rio Grande to find a job. You know, that's, uh, you know, it, 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 all this military the aircraft carriers aren't any good for that. They, but first of all, the Rio Grande's all dried up because of the drought, and, and you couldn't float an aircraft carrier in the Rio Grande. It, it's, it's not even b b but a creek, I know, because I've, it runs right by my house in New Mexico. So, but nuclear weapons don't make us any safer. I mean, we're getting beat in Iraq right now with our nuclear weapons. What are we going to do? Drop, uh, drop nuclear weapons on Baghdad? We, what about all the guys that we've got there? And we've got a lot of friends there, too, you know. I'm Alan Roebuck from Rutgers. Uh, I was trying to think, who is the current situation good for? It's good, as you mentioned, for the big companies that make all of this stuff, and global warming situation is good for Exxon that sells, sells oil and makes $40 billion. How can, you, how can we practically attack them? They're the enemy, because they want business no, they're as not. usual. We're the enemy, in my opinion. It's us. I, 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 wish, uh, I wish it was, we could blame it on ExxonMobil. They, 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 they just make the gas. They don't run it around in, the, in their cars. And, and there's a lot of ways to mitigate that. For instance, I've got, for the last six years, I've had a uh, Toyota Prius, a hybrid, when it just came out. And I doubled my gas mileage. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do. You don't have to. And I, even in my office now, I, I keep the, wind, the blinds up and I turn the lights out and I sit there in the dark in my office working. You know, because I don't want to turn on the lights. 
but, but, but that's okay. I'm, I'm trying my very dead level best to, uh, to do the right thing. And if everybody does that, we'll, we'll be able to handle this. We're going to be able to handle this, uh, glo the global warming thing too, but it's going to take a lot of effort. But it'll be, it'll be fun. I mean, you know, never before in the history of the world have human beings done the right thing on a consistent basis. <laughs> this will be the first time. You know, that'll be fun to be there. I want to live long enough to see it happen. That's why I want, I'm, I'm going to be 70 this fall, and I don't know how many years I've got left, and I want to live long enough to see global nuclear disarmament. God damn it, that's what I want, and I'm asking the rest of y'all to help me. That's, that's what I want for my 80th birthday. I want to be able to lay down on my deathbed and say my grandchildren and all the other grandchildren that were are safe for the foreseeable future. Wouldn't that be nice? Huh? How many of y'all have grandchildren? You know, how many love them? <laughs> how many don't give a damn whether they get blown to kingdom come or not? No, come on. <laughs> and that's true of the Russians too, right? You bet. And the Chinese. Are we not done yet? Now, uh, I'm Dick Garwin. If I look back to the Reagan administration, I see that the Bureau of the Budget wanted to tax all the money, put it into defense, so that we wouldn't be spending it on social goals. And we have that problem. We cannot make up our mind. We have earmarks go to individual districts, but we have very great difficulty deciding how to spend the money that we can raise from the population. What do you think we can do about that? if we do reduce the uh, defense budget? You know, just do the smart thing. You know, I, I, you got that, that's, that's all stuff that you work out with politics. You know, not that nuclear disarmament will be worked out eventually, the politicians will be involved with it, uh, with it too, but, but you know, in a, in a country, in a free country, uh, where we have elections, we can change the government, so we ought to put in the government that, that's going to do what we want them to do. I mean, I, I voted, the, you know, during Bush's first term, and uh, I, I voted for Al Gore, and uh, if we'd have gotten him as president, we would already have global warming would be a, a receding problem instead of a bigger one. We, we made the wrong choices, but we got to start making the right choices. That's all. If we do that, we'll be fine. You know, if we're smart, we're fine. If we're stupid, we lose. <laughs> I'll take the last question from Mrs. Calabresi. Thank you. I'm Ann Calabresi, a member of this community. Mr. Turner, you are the master of communication. I'm what? You are the master of communication. I am. You have got <laughs> it down cold. And I imagine that there are a lot of people that would agree with you. Do you see a way? that our new magical internet and your way of communication can get this message out to a wider audience that can it's then- It's all over the place. It's already there. Lester Brown- yeah. uh, But how uh, do we connect them? Where's how the guy that's them? here that, that wrote uh, Seventh Generation? He's going to speak this afternoon. He's got the answers. Just to do, what, do, what, do what those two books say and you'll be fine. But connect them. How do we connect them? How I do don't know. Them? Read them both, one back to back. <laughs> It's all the information's out there. I mean, it's all over the internet. It's all over the place. Uh, you know, if I can dig it up, you can too. I already told you. Jonathan Shell's book, his latest book just came out. Read it. And oh, I, 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 I'm doing my, my autobiography is going to be out after uh, the election's over. Please buy it too. Uh, there's a lot of good information in there. And uh, anyway, Lester Brown's book. Plan B, 3.0. Read those and you got it made. That's all the information you need. It takes a couple of hours and you're done. Thank you.